Welcome to Audition Talks. Today I am so pleased to welcome a friend of mine, a great cellist and an exceptional musician, Mikhail Hachnazarian. Mikhail is the cellist of the renowned Kuss Quartet. He is also the principal cellist of Munich Chamber Orchestra, as well as a regular guest of Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra. Welcome to Audition Talks, Mikhail. It's great to have you here. Thank you for the invitation. I'm really glad to be here and to maybe contribute somehow to what you do, what I find absolutely great. I'm really excited about the topics we are going to discuss together and I think it is going to be very interesting for musicians watching this episode. And I would like to start with the topic we were discussing earlier when we were talking about the recent release of your latest recording, A Cycle of Beethoven Quartets, as we were talking about offering a new vision to the public. Nowadays, there is such a wide choice of excellent musicians and quartets, this creates a sort of a competition among them. So, it's crucial to find how you are going to stand out and introduce something new with your interpretation. I found our earlier conversation fascinating that it's still possible to find a new and fresh perspective of the piece that we have heard played so many times and know so well. What I would like to ask you is to share what you do differently in a piece that has been played by so many quartets. I wanted to offer this point of view especially with musicians that are auditioning because I'm sure there is so much value to be found in this advice that you are going to share with us. Because this is exactly what it takes to be successful with auditions. To position yourself above your competitors and get noticed by the jury. And that is by making a difference with your playing in the same piece that is performed by everyone. Uh, yes, it's a complicated question, I guess. Uh, because as you mentioned, that uh, you have to look with a fresh eye and fresh ear. I don't think, not just looking, I think it's absolutely necessary that you look to the same score that you have already experienced, the same score that you have, you seem to know. You have to look at it every single time, like, like for the first time. Okay, this is something I think we all heard many times, people saying it, that we have to have this new approach, but I understand your question. Uh, maybe we should go a little bit more into it as what does this exactly mean? Mm -hmm. So to us with the quartet, again, as you mentioned, everybody plays the same pieces. We heard it hundred times over and over in the concert halls, the same Beethoven quartets. And we were also wondering, do we really need to record it? Uh, because automatically, of, of, case, of course, you are sort of there is this competition and you are compared to the others. But this is, uh, I think, not very important thing. Of course, you cannot please to a, everyone anyway. So uh, we were thinking that if we do it now, it should be something that is very important to us in this very moment. So it means that to find a way that what we are doing in the very moment, it's very relevant for us and very relevant for the uh, moment we are playing. So for the, for the situation, for the general situation in the world, for the, for the place we are playing, for the people we are playing. So the, this word relevant, I think it's kind of a key, which means that now we speak about Beethoven, but I think this applies to every single piece of music. So if you, if you want to play this quartet or violin concerto or cello concerto, of course, all your preparation is going for this moment when you will be on stage and will be performing it. So this, so again, this being very concentrated on this very exact moment that this is happening just once and is very relevant in this very moment. So uh, to start, of course, the preparation is a very long journey, right? So we look at it once more, then we find out, as you very nicely said, the uh, hidden information, hidden messages, also the very obvious messages 
we should look at them once more and find it out and uh, uncode, as you nicely said, uncode all these, uh, uh, let's say, formulas or great messages. More importantly, to understand why is the piece great? It's very easy to say it's such a great music, but what makes it great? I think this is sometimes missing in, let's say, some other performances. In no means I want to judge anyone or anyone's playing, but I some often think that when people say there's a danger for classical music in generally, there is, uh, it's, it has been played a million times over and over the same way and is boring. And we complain that our audience, let's say, is very old, etc., uh, etc. Et I think it's partly our fault in the way that if we if we play the piece in a let's call it normal classical standard way, yes, there is a danger that it gets a little bit boring. So once we have figured out what is what the, what makes the piece great, and another important aspect is. Uh, what does it make with you? So in what way it is important for you? Because uh, it cannot get too theoretical. It means that we are still on stage and we are getting involved, obviously, emotionally, but everything has to be concentrated in the final goal. And the final goal would be, how do you present this great piece to the audience in a way that they are really involved? involved uh, not just emotionally because emotional aspect is something i think easy so you get something you every human being is happy to hear a nice melody and some beautiful harmonies but uh, i think this is not enough if it's just let's say it stays with superficial if we want it, them to get more out of it so they also enjoy as much as we do the greatness of these pieces i think we have to serve them this information in in very uh, understandable, in very accessible, and still and yet enjoyable way. Maybe it sounds a little bit complicated, but to summarize, so yes, the preparation has to have, of course, many many different sort of very well planned uh, uh, ways. But the final goal would be that the combination of everything you have done is still that it's in order to represent this piece at its best and involve everybody all the listeners you want them to be moved you want them to understand what you do and then there is more chance that there will be just interaction between the the artist on a stage and the listener yes yes i uh, totally agree with you what you are saying now about the importance of bringing what you are feeling to the audience. It's something what we feel and it's uh, to, to, to find a way to, to bring it to the listener. That is the difficult thing. To yeah, do. that's the very important access. I think this is, uh, this is where the music comes alive. Because also this sentence we hear often when we say this should come alive, but we have to understand how to make it that it comes alive. It's not enough just to say, as we often heard, this should be very, it, can you play it more musical? Can you play it more open? It is a little bit, it is important, but it remains theoretical. Of course, the performance itself should not sound very theoretical and overanalyzed. But as I mentioned before, so the work has to definitely have, the base of the work should at least start with that. If you really find out exactly all these details, what we spoke about, because I think we just, we cannot afford to, I mean, we should not ignore this greatness of this composer, not only saying how great the melody is, what a great melody Mozart was writing, but I mean, these great people are, it's, it's unbelievable intelligent how it's done. We can argue whether it's uh, conscious or unconscious. This is a different thing. But uh, for example, we speak now about Beethoven. We all know what kind of 
person he was and how hard he worked and how how perfectionist he was in every single thing he was doing he was obsessed with perfection he was uh, this is a famous thing so every morning he had a coffee and he had to make sure that he has 66 coffee beans not 65 not 67 <laughs> and he would go crazy for if something goes wrong or not the way he wants it at the same time being let's say so pragmatic as a person obviously the connection to the whatever you call it to the different uh, forces and everything is there because he better than saw himself in a competition with god these are his words this is something important he even this he brings sort of down to the to earth this this thought as he said like look god created uh, everything probably and i i'm doing the same the music that i'm writing is the same it has this kind of value the creation that he's doing and i would sort of agree with this because in the music that beethoven left for us there is absolutely absolutely everything i think there's no other composer who can express every single human feeling, type of feeling, uh, better than Beethoven. This is something absolutely incredible. And coming back to beginning, that speaking about this whole cycle of Beethoven, we had a feeling that when you play all of these quartets, you meet all of the composers on the way. There is absolutely everything. I don't want to eliminate every composer from our musical life, but I can say that if there was only Beethoven, we would also already be unbelievably rich and grateful uh, for the music that he, is, he has written for us. And every single piece has a very big importance to the time he was writing, to the events that were happening. Again, when we speak about the importance of knowing the composer, knowing the period he was writing, we often hear this. Yes, that's absolutely right. And again, it should not be just an information which I read in the book, and it says, yes, I should read the biography of the composer. Of course, we have to. But then, so today we are playing these pieces in 2020, 2021, and they are still very relevant because the problematic of those days and nowadays actually didn't change much human being didn't change much. So the bad and the good side of human being remain the same. So the pieces are as relevant or even more relevant now or as relevant as the back in these days. Back in his days, it was absolutely revolutionary. Every single thing he wrote, and this was his clear idea. Everything he writes has to be revolutionary. So. I'm sorry, I mean, it's getting a bit too long, but just, I mean, he completely changed the form of composing, at least if we speak about string quartets. All the string quartets became much longer, just simply speaking from the time. Yeah, so he wrote six quartets, opus 18. They are more or less, let's say, referring to what was before, to Mozart or to Haydn. And again, so this package, let's say, of six, Mozart was always writing six quartets. Haydn was writing always in so this sort of, there was a unwritten rule of six quartets, like Londoner, London quartets, Prussian quartets of Mozart and this and that. So the fact that Beethoven wrote his first quartet with 29, which is incredibly late. If we think of Mozart writing with six, seven and eight, some sketching his operas, so it means Beethoven has been waiting so much, but then showing, okay, now I show you how it goes. So he wrote the sixth quartet, which are opus 18. And from there on, this big jump to the next section, which is which are the Razumovsky quartets, big gap, opus 18, and then opus 59. From Razumovsky's on, the form is completely different. As I said, the length of the movements the length of the slow variation movements are suddenly 15, 16, 17, 20 minutes. This has never been like this. And obviously, 
later quartets or the middle there is one shortest quartet the serioso opus 95 which was just sort of a need from him to write something like this some outburst and he writes that this is actually not to be played in public it's just it's something explosive what maybe he felt he needs to do and then all the other great quartets and then late quartets some of them are almost an hour or the, so he completely he set a new sort of again unwritten rules the new way of writing maybe for me the symphonies are in a way much more classical and uh, the way one writes yeah the the structure of the movements the amount of movements and the quartets are just a huge revolution and no wonder that for example when you talk to the fantastic musicians fantastic pianists like for example andra Schiff, that they all the beethoven string quartets for them has the same importance like uh, let's say the same importance in their piano repertoire so to know these quartets to study these quartets we were astonished when uh, we were once in bonn in a beethoven house and we were so lucky that we were we had an access to to the manuscripts and when you look of course you look at this handwriting and you feel you feel something you feel the dynamic how suddenly one bar where you have a crescendo the whole bar becomes the entire line it's just one bar because you feel the motion how and mm -hmm. uh, and the, the person who was uh, welcoming us there he said every single pianist comes and looks at the string quartet no one picks up the piano sonatas piano concertos they say can i have a look to opus 131 135 cross a fuga or or 74 so it shows again what an incredible central point in a classical repertoire the beethoven quartets have yeah and as as you uh, as you told uh, he was he he knew exactly what he was uh, doing exactly what he was writing and uh, you told that he waited for so long so long huh, compared to the mozart to mozart and what is interesting is that mozart um, he wrote and we know that he didn't make much corrections he was writing like you know what it was coming from his head and uh, also uh, the precision and what he wanted exactly it was still there so it was this knowledge what it's not just a random musical uh, melody and idea he had he wrote but it was yeah maybe of course the the idea musical melody had in his head but then after how he was putting it on the on the on the on the paper to make the 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 score it was also very precise and um, and I'm, I'm really looking forward for the next video when we are going to discuss this so thing. I, I yeah. Like quote of Harlan Kurban <laughs> when he says about Mozart, he says, it's not genius, it's much more than this. Mm. So, of course, we can argue, yes, how, how did he write with no correction, with no mistakes? But it doesn't mean that this music is simpler composed or we also, we cannot say yes, but he was much more uh let's say genius or or more intelligent than beethoven is absolutely useless discussion with there is no room to compare these people absolutely. exactly so there is the uh, one quartet of opus 131 by beethoven the, before starting it's very interesting beethoven was saying for him the most difficult is to start the piece and for opus 131 there are 500 pages of sketches mm. escape that it remained luckily mm -hmm. 500 pages where he did not know or he, he was trying out how to start and then the result of this seven movement quartet it's absolutely incredible and exact and especially how the piece starts i don't mean the first bar but the how the whole first movement then you feel sort of the struggle of somebody who was spending maybe months and months to start the piece and yet so coming back to mozart we know he was playing a billiard and then writing the most incredible melodies we have today. So I think, the, as, as I said, so this, the intelligence of, of these great people should not be ignored. So yeah. yes, I'm also uh, really happy to, if we can share something, looking at the score. Right, Maybe right, right. Find yeah. something, some new approach or 
not a new approach, but to point out something what what are for me as a non-violinist, I just look at it as a material and and we can look if there is something what very you know to point yeah. out some things which are yeah yeah consciously absolutely. or unconsciously written by this crazy genius. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that will be really, yeah. really insightful and very interesting for our listeners.